Hi everyone, this is Professor Ian. This is my lecture on lyrical poetry and a brief talk about the Romantics, uh, which is not a band, but a uh, poetry movement from the 18th and 19th century that I'll touch on briefly because they kind of reinvigorated the idea of lyrical poetry in an interesting way. So anyways, <clears throat> to start off, I just wanted to um, talk about this difference between types of poetry or categories of poetry, however you want to think about this. And this is according to Aristotle. He split poetry into, um, uh, he had three categories. He loved the number three, I guess. He had three types of, uh, of, of, of drama as well, uh, satire uh, or satire, uh, tragedy and comedy. And so here we have his types of poetry. He split poetry into narrative or what he called epic, dramatic, and lyrical. And so we're going to talk about lyrical today. And types of poetry are different than forms, right? Forms we've been talking about, that just um, refers to the structure um, of the poem, you know, how many lines it has to be, rhyme structure, uh, that kind of stuff. I mean, some of these forms obviously uh, uh, only really fit certain kind, certain types of poetry, right? Like a sonnet, uh, as we'll see, is... is you know, I guess it could be narrative or dramatic, but usually lyrical. Same with an ode. I can't imagine really a, an ode being anything but lyrical. A ballad, usually uh, narrative, right? Because it's telling a story. Haikus are always lyrical. Uh, free verse could be anything. So anyways, there's, there's a difference between the type of poetry and poetic forms. And so we're just talking about this category of poetry called lyrical poetry during this lecture. So what is lyrical poetry? Well, Let's think about what it isn't. Uh, narrative poetry tells stories, right? It has uh, narrative qualities, plot, character, that kind of stuff. Dramatic poetry is basically a play written in verse, right? So dramatic monologues like uh, My Last Duchess, written from a character's point of view. Lyrical poetry, however, encompasses a wide range of other forms and approaches. It's kind of like, you know, the catch-all of other poetry, uh, according to Aristotle. Uh, I think. People would maybe say that there are other categories these days, but you know, it's, it is useful to think about lyrical poetry as a category, an important category of poetry. It's still definitely used to categorize poetry. Um, it's the most common type of poetry you're gonna come across, and it's also the hardest to fully define. It's the most baggy uh, uh, category. You know, narrative and dramatic are pretty easy to spot, but, are, but lyrical is a bit, uh, encompasses a lot more. So what is lyrical poetry? It's typically short poems, <clears throat> uh, emotionally expressive, really getting into that, the, the emotion of the speaker in the poem. Typically has a musical quality. The name itself, you know, lyrical, comes from uh, the Greek word, you know, it used to be, they had a lyre, which was this um, kind of like a little mini harp, uh, somewhat like a stringed instrument such as that. <clears throat> and, you know, they would uh, set a lyrical poem to music on the lyre. Lyrical poetry is narrated in the first person, or an implied first person, like a lot of Emily Dickinson poetry. Uh, traditionally, you know, for the Greeks, uh, lyrical poetry had very formal rules, but now lyrical poetry can take many different forms. And so that's what I was talking about, the difference between form and type earlier. So mainly, we talk about lyrical poetry with its focus, right? This first person expression of ideas and thoughts, and really exploring the emotion of the speaker. So let's look at a couple examples. Here's an old, old poem from Sappho, the ancient Greek uh, poetess, of which we only have fragments of her poetry. But this is, you know, some of it's very beautiful. I love this one. Uh, he seems like the gods equal that man, whoever he is, who takes his seat so close across from you and listens raptly to your lilting voice and lovely laughter, which, as it wafts by, sets the heart in my ribcage fluttering. As soon as I glance at you a moment, I can't say a thing, and my tongue stiffens into silence. Thin flames underneath my skin prickle and spark. A rush of blood blooms in my ears, and then my eyes go dark. And sweat pours coldly over me, and all my body shakes. Suddenly shallow, or sallower than summer grass, and death I fear and feel is very near. Such a beautiful, beautiful imagery in that poem, evoking the, the jealousy or the... That, I can't think of anything but jealousy to describe, you know, watching uh, a person you're interested in uh, canoodling with somebody else and just this, you know, the, the bodily reaction, such a, such an evocative poem. 
and, you know, it is using this moment, but it's not narrative. It's not really telling a story, right? It's getting into the emotional response of the speaker rather than using those narrative tools to tell a story. Let's look at another example. And that's Sappho, ancient Greek, uh, so very, very old. This is much more recent uh, from the 17th century, the 1600s. This is uh, Basho, and I, I'm, you know, I'm probably butchering uh, the Japanese name. This is his most famous, probably his most famous haiku, Old Pond. So Old Pond, frogs leap and water sound. So haikus are these great little moments uh, of reflection uh, that, you know, offer an insight into the, the speaker's mind in these kind of opaque ways that really require you to reflect and take a moment to, to think about them and ex experience that with the, the reader or with the speaker. So again, you know, it has, it's about an experience, but it's not narrative in the way that it's telling a story about something, right? It's using it as a moment of reflection. Let's look at a more um, modern example. This is from W.H. Auden, if I could tell you. Time will say nothing, but I told you so. Time only knows the price we have to pay. If I could tell you, I would let you know. If we should keep weep when clowns put on their show, if we should stumble when musicians play, time will say nothing, but I told you so. There are no fortunes to be told, although, because I love you more than I could say, than I can say, if I could tell you what I would let you know. The winds must come from somewhere when they blow. There must be reasons why the leaves decay. Time will say nothing, but I told you so. Perhaps the roses really want to grow. The vision seriously intends to stay. If I could tell you, I would let you know. Suppose all the lions get up and go, and all the brooks and soldiers run away. Will time say nothing, but I told you so? If I could tell you, I would let you know. So beautiful little poem about, um, you know, the, the, the limits of being human. Uh, WH on writes about that a lot. Uh, but, you get, but the point here, um, not to get into too much of an analysis of these three poems, but these are all examples of lyrical poetry, right? First person, short, emotive, exploring the speaker's emotions and you know, thoughts about the world, using an experience as a, as a jumping off point uh, for the most part. But, you know, very different approaches, very different styles, you know, forms, but all examples of lyrical poetry. So that's what we're talking about. Uh, and I just want to say a couple words about the Romantic movement. Um, this is a poetic movement of the late 18th and 19th century. And it's not, you know, about love necessarily. There's, you know, some love poems they wrote, but uh, it's not the romance that we're talking about. Um, uh, this is a romance as in a, a, a belief in higher ideals, right? Not romances in uh, Harlequin novels. So, um, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, started, uh, you know, we, we trace it to around the French Revolution going into the 19th century, around you know 1850-ish kind of thing, when we get more into the Victorian period, uh, maybe even earlier if you want to if you want to break it down. Uh, but a short period at that 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 time, and it's the, the the Romantic movement is mainly this reaction against the empiricism and the formalism of the previous period, which we call the Enlightenment period, which was uh, a very important period for a lot of a lot of um, empirical philosophy coming out of that period. There was a lot of scientific development. The uh, fiction was a lot of satire, making fun of or using satire to point out the foibles of, of political problems of the era um, uh, and a movement away from uh, kind of the more emotional side of things. It was the Enlightenment writers like to see themselves as uh, more logical and formal in their writing. Uh, so we had this movement against that, right? We have a, a generation of writers saying, well, this isn't enough to describe the human experience. And so they started really turning to nature and emotion for inspiration and content. But this is not to say that the Romantic movement was an organized group. It wasn't like a group of, of writers who got together and said, hey, let's call ourselves the Romantic movement and really do this. It's, you know, something that coalesced and, you know, it was in the ethos, you might say, of the generation to react against the formalism of the previous generation, which is, you know, often how these movements go, right? You have one generation doing one thing and then the next generation reacts against that because they find certain limits in it. You know, it's a natural progression, uh, Hegel would say. So anyways, uh, in Britain, the main figures we associate with the period are Wordsworth, Coleridge, Keats, uh, Shelley, 
and you might know her, uh, his wife's name too, Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein, Blake, and Byron. So if you want to look those fellas up, uh, I have links in my PowerPoints. There are some other figures. There are some women attached to the movement, but these are what we call the big six uh, romantic poets. Uh, there are, you know, obviously this isn't all the romantic poets. There were tons of romantic poets or romantic painters, like the one, the painter who did this painting. But these are the big six. And as a kind of um, fundamental idea that they had, we could turn to John Keats. He wrote, uh, if poetry comes not as naturally as the leaves to a tree, it had better not come at all, right? So you can see that there, in the ethos of this movement, there's this real focus on um, uh, the, the naturalness of poetry, the spontaneity of poetry, and how it's coming from inside of you, right? This is a super uh, fundamental idea to the movement. Early romantic poets uh, were also often supportive of, you know, what we might call progressive politics, you know, revolutionary politics, uh, women's rights, things like that. Some of them kind of, uh, you know, Wordsworth and Coleridge kind of, they lived long enough that they became old men and soured on these things. But, you know, Keats died, he was 28 when he died. And, you know, uh, so even younger, I can't remember right now, but uh, he died as a young man, as this fiery revolutionary and, you know, um, Shelley and Byron are also very revolutionary. There were a lot of uh, revolutionary poetry. Blake, who uh, we read earlier in the semester, um, uh, was a very unconventional fellow. That's one way to put it. Anyway, so some of the things they were concerned with, uh, they had this these these aesthetic categories that they were interested in. Um, the beautiful, so this is the, the surface beauty of things. They were celebrating surface beauty. But they were also interested in this, what they considered a deeper form of beauty they called the sublime or was known as the sublime. They didn't uh, coin that term that came from, uh, you know, other thinkers, including Burke. But, uh, you know, the sublime is this kind of deeper soul affecting power of nature, right? Uh, the kind of mysterious power of nature that isn't necessarily good or like, you know, entirely beautiful, but powerful and inspiring and and really get your soul moving, right? So they were interested in trying to tap into this. And you can see how that's a reaction from the, to the previous generation. But the most influential idea, and the main reason I wanted to bring this, well, one of the reasons I wanted to bring this up is that they really popularized and cemented this idea of the lone poet communing with nature and then turning this into spontaneous lyrical poetry, which is, I think, something that still hangs with us, this idea that poets just kind of wander out to nature and have this experience this this soul changing experience and come back and jot it down on paper and that's this beautiful poetry that changes the world and of course you know not even wordsworth or Cole, coleridge pardon me actually did that they went home and they might have written a poem but then they would work on it work on it work on it work on it like everybody does with poetry but the uh, romantics definitely made this idea of the the kind of um well the romantic poet <laughs> the uh the kind of uh, uh, soul searching poet. This is really comes from the romantic movement, which I has totally influenced poetry since then. People reacting against it, people becoming a stereotype and a cliche. But anyway, super influential. So let's look at uh, a poem by Williams Wirt, William Wordsworth as an example. I wandered lonely as a cloud. You might have heard this before or read it. Beautiful little poem. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high over vales and hills. When all at once I saw a crowd of a host of golden daffodils beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretch a never ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand I saw at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waters in glee. A poet could not but be gay, could not be gay, could not but be gay, sorry, and of course gay in the, the older sense. In such jocund company, I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth this show to me had brought. For oft when my couch, on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude, and then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. So again, this lone poet, the eye, going out into, the, into nature, having this experience, and having this kind of soul-changing soul experience, right? They flash upon that inward eye. So getting this idea of the sublime, which is the bliss of solitude, right? This lone poet having this experience that changes uh, everything he thinks. And notice the musical quality to the poem too, the internal rhymes, the uh, alliteration and such. Anyways, that's it for now. This is our brief tour of lyrical poetry. I hope you enjoyed it.
Thank you very much.